be here as well. Uh, I just want to introduce our speaker to you for today. Uh, our guest is Erhan Erkut, as you know. Uh, he is the vice rector of MEF University, and he is also the founder of uh, Yetgen. So I'll just leave the state, stage for him with a round of applause. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Quiet. What, what, what? I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> Relax. Uh, by the way, I am that and more. I consider myself an education activist, and uh, I'm also the academic director of a uh, newly found Canadian online high school. I'm a Canadian citizen, as well as Turkish citizen. Any Canadians here? None? Only one? Okay, hello. How are you? So I've, uh, I've come back to Turkey um, in 2005, after 20 years in Canada. Uh, originally, I went to school at Istanbul Erkek Lisesi, which is the top high school in Turkey, you may have heard of it. Then I went to, sorry, then I went to, uh, I mean, among the national high schools, let's say. And then I went to Boğaziçi University, which is the top university in Turkey. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, I consider myself to be very fortunate. And then I decided to study a little bit more, and I got a PhD at the University of Florida in Industrial and Systems Engineering. Uh, so I know quite a bit about the American university system especially at the graduate level. And then I got a job offer uh, from Canada. I uh, started working there in 1985. It's like, this is like before Christ for you guys. You weren't born back then, of course. Um, I found uh, myself a beautiful wife. And then I have uh, generated, created, uh, propagated <laughs> two beautiful girls, which uh, you'll see right next year. Selen is on the right-hand side. And Esra is on the left-hand side. Does your dad have your name on his arm? Yeah? No? Um, uh, you just tell him. Some dads do, okay? Uh, and then in 2005, I got bored, and I thought I'd go back to the old country. I've lived in Turkey since, but uh, my girls have uh, stayed in Canada. They actually came back to Turkey for about six years, and then they wanted to go back to school in Canada. Our school system is... Uh, they were very unhappy at IICS, by the way. They, they were students at IICS. Have you heard of this place? It's a, it's a school that thinks of itself as comparable to a MEF International. But uh, they, seriously, um, I thought it was a rather poor choice. Uh, of course, my wife chose the school, and I had no say in the matter um, because that was her condition. In fact, we rented a place in Alkent to be close to the school. Uh, and then they decided they wanted to move back to Canada. Uh, so I've been traveling about six times a year between Canada and Turkey to continue seeing my girls. Um, I can tell you more about my girls if you're interested because this is one of the things that got me interested in career planning and uh, you know future of jobs because I was interested in their future, what is going to happen to them when they grow up. And they've, went, they've been through... Uh, your life phase a few years back. Um, Seren's uh, 25, I think. I think. Yeah, 25. Esra is 23. Um, they're both graduates now. Um, Seren studied uh, liberal arts. Okay. She decided to go for visual design, and then she switched to liberal arts. Um, and Esra studied uh, molecular genetics, and she loved it so much, she keeps studying it. She's a, a master's slash PhD student at the University of Toronto now. Uh, anyone interested in molecular genetics? Don't be, it's terrible. <laughs> Seriously, um, I mean, she loves it, okay. I mean, she can do whatever she wants. It's not up to me to tell her what to do. But, okay, this is not an exaggeration. She actually graduated from the University of Alberta with a GPA of 4.0. And she received the top prize, which is given to students who combine a good GPA with social activities and clubs and so on. So this is a large university, okay? 40,000 students. <laughs> she graduates number one. Uh, she gets a full scholarship from the University of Toronto. 
plus uh, $26,000 stipend a year, which is barely enough to get by in Toronto. Okay, so far so good. But she's going to do 11 more years of schooling after... Oh, yeah, baba, öyle işte. Yani, yeah. <laughs> Molecular genetics, okay, baba. 11 years after university. It's two years master's, five years PhD, seven. Two more years for postdoc and two more years for internship. Oh, baba. Yani, you, kızım dedim, you'll be old. <laughs> baba dedi, I love this. Okay, dedim. She could actually quit after seven years and be a professor, okay? But she wants to go beyond that. She wants to be a clinical geneticist. It's the only profession in the hospital that does not require an MD. If you want to work in a hospital, or if you don't want to graduate from a school of medicine, you have to be a clinical geneticist, okay? So she's a true scientist to the bone, okay? And, uh, you know, incredible... Uh, disciplined, hardworking, you know, of course, intelligent, and mom's intelligent. Uh, but my older girl, I mean, she does drugs. I, I tell her not to, okay? She smokes pot. She drinks, okay? Uh, moderately. We tell her, uh, keep it. She still graduated with 3.5 or 3.7, something like that. But uh, I think her career plan was actually, it, it, it's... Uh, Somewhat relevant. I think this is how kids should make career plans. My younger daughter, she just was such a great student. She could she could have succeeded in anything. Okay, she just joined a well-known path. Whereas my older daughter, she told me. I asked her the question to ask kids is not what you want to be, what do you want to be, but what do you want to do? Okay. Uh, when you say, what do you want to be? You're actually classifying people as engineers, doctors, designers, this and that, okay? But the real question is, what do you want to change in, in the world? What do you want to accomplish? So if your parent asks you, if one of your parents asks you what you want to be, you just tell them you want to be a good human being, okay? The real question is, what do you want to do with your life? How do you want to contribute to the world? How do you want to contribute to the society? When I asked my daughter this question, she said, I want to create, um, design posters for NGOs that support disadvantaged individuals. Wow, I mean, okay. So she likes photography, she likes design. She entered some poster comp design competitions at school and she succeeded, you know, she won prizes and so on. And she's an activist. She's a feminist, LGBT supporter. So she wanted to combine these things, okay? So she wanted to design posters for an NGO that works for disadvantaged people. Um, street uh, animals, um, people of uh, indigenous backgrounds, all sorts of disadvantaged individuals. So I asked her, well, how are you going to do this? Is there a special program at the university to design posters for NGOs that support disadvantaged individuals? He said, Baba, don't joke with me. Of course, I'm going to have to go to a school of design. Okay. But that's not enough. Because I want to appeal to the hearts of the people, I also need a minor in psychology. I said, okay. That's now social sciences, design, social sciences. And she said, because I actually want people to support my NGOs, I need to learn about social marketing. That's in the School of Business. So here she is, you know, 17 years old. She's designing a path for herself, highly individualized path that combines classes from design, social sciences, and business. This is what you ought to do, okay? Don't just sign up to be an engineer. Don't just sign up to be a doctor or social scientist. Ask yourselves what you want to accomplish in life. And then the next question is, which courses do I need to help me get there? How do I support myself? So you create your own degree program. And this is what career planning should be all about. Because the options given to you by universities are incredibly limited and limiting. You don't want to be limited by those. You want to create your own path. You want to be, I mean, you are unique as individuals, and you want to continue your uniqueness 
on the path to university. Don't assume that we, the adults, know what's best for you. We don't know shit. I mean, we just try to put together some you know, basic, common educational streams, and it's up to you to weave in and out of them. Now, after all this beautiful thinking, what did she do? She got into the design program. It's an honors program, which required no Bs, all A's and A minuses, and she found it too stressful. She got herself dismissed from, from the program. I thought, well, why do you do that? She said, I can't get out. I can't opt out. I must be dismissed, okay? So she took a couple of Bs. She was kicked out of the program, transferred to liberal arts. And then in the meantime, she became a member of a, a fraternity. Actually, they're called sororities in the U.S. You know what they are? These Alpha, Pi, Beta, Gamma, Kappa, you know, these Greek houses. Um, she became uh, first the marketing director of the sorority. Uh, they're called fraternities in Canada, boy or girl, they're called fraternities. In, in the U.S., boy ones are fraternities, girl ones are sororities. There are four, only four sororities on campus, and there's about maybe a dozen or so fraternities. After she became the marketing director, she became the president of her own sorority. And in her final year, she became the president of all the soror fraternities on campus. Interfraternity Council President. So then the university just offered her a job. Okay, so she is now working in student services, uh, managing 500 student clubs on campus. Okay, so interesting career choices, right? You intend to be a poster designer, which of course is a joke. There won't be any posters in the future. It's going to be all digital. She knew that, so she's trying to beef up her digital side as well. And then she switches gears because she's actually an activist. She wants to do social good, okay? That becomes overweighing, and she gets an offer from the university. She decides to stay at the university. I said, what's next? She said she wants to do grad school in um, environmental design. I said, why? She said, the world needs more green spaces. Again, the question is, what does the world need, and how can I help the world? Not, what are you going to be? I want to be a good boy. That's not the right question. All right, so enough of my stories with the girls. If you want to plan ahead, you know, ahead is in the future. You need to look into the future a little bit. So for that, I, I'm kind of lazy. I don't consider myself a futurist or, you know, some person with X-ray vision. I just read, okay? There are consulting companies that produce reports. And this is one that I find particularly useful or enlightening. Um, reports on megatrends, okay? Megatrends are, by the way, the slides are in Turkish, but I'm doing simultaneous translation because I'm too lazy to translate all my slides into English for just one presentation. You guys are the only school that asked me to do a presentation in English. What am I going to do after this, you know? I have to switch back to Turkish. So most of the slides are in Turkish. Some of them are in English. But these are the political uh, and geostrategic forces that shape our future. We call them megatrends, okay? They represent the biggest problems and the biggest opportunities for the society. You need to know about the megatrends to predict where the world is going. Um, there's five that everybody agrees on. There's a couple more, you know, more recently, um, for example, um, the uh, influx of refugees is, is identified as a new megatrend. And also these pandemics identified another more recent megatrend. But uh, the five that everybody agrees on uh, are these five. And I'll just give you an example uh, of, of each one. Uh, the first one is demographic shifts. Second one is shift in economic power. The third one is accelerating urbanization. The fourth one is climate change and the depletion of scarce resources. And the fifth one is uh, technology. Okay. Now, um, are they all in the IB program? No. Okay. Now, those of you in the IB, I, I think IB is the world. I think think of IBS as, as the best educational system that mankind has been able to put together. 
So if you're not in IB, if you graduate of this school, if you're not an IB student, if I'm interviewing you for a job, I'd say, why did you not get an IB diploma? And you have to tell me. You have to have an explanation why you refused such a beautiful program. Okay? Yeah, you can't just say because it it's hard. Because it's a job interview, okay? You have to say something more. Now, if you're an IB student, none of this is going to be foreign to you. But mm, I don't know about your curriculum. You're sort of a privileged school, really. But the curricula of the standard Turkish high schools includes none of these, okay? I asked them, what is, uh, what, what is our number one problem? Let me ask you this. What's the number one problem in the world? Hmm? War. No. It's always been with us, lady. We've always been warring. And we actually war a lot less these days than we used to 200 years ago. And it's going to stay with us as a problem. It's not something that's different. Yeah, I hate what Russia is doing as well. But it's not new. Poverty? <laughs> Till about 200 years ago, we were all poor, okay? Are you poor? No. Hello. How can you say poverty is our biggest problem when you're paying shitloads of money <laughs> to this school? Guys, this is not a joke. Until the year 1800, we were all poor. The whole earth was poor, okay? What made some of us rich is technology. We owe it to the technology. The increase in human welfare is due to technology. Right now, we're really afraid of technology. Well, we're going to lose our job. Hey, if it weren't for technology, you wouldn't be here, okay? You'd still be fighting for a meager existence on the streets day by day, okay? You'd be living hand to mouth. Environmental issues. Thank you, sir. Why did it take three tries? Climate change, okay? Climate change is the number one issue in the world right now, period, because that's new, okay? wasn't the case 200 years ago. And if you don't control it, we won't have an earth to fight about or to cry about poverty. Um, unfortunately, these topics are not covered in high schools. And it seems to me that they're not terribly well covered here either. So maybe, Hojam, this is homework for you. Every, every MEF International graduate ought to know that climate change is our number one problem. And we should do what we can to change that. Huh? Noted. Yeah, thank you. Now, I'll give you one example of each. Demographic shift. I'll start with demographic shift. Now, you guys are a um, rather fortunate crowd because you'll be actually seeing the world go from young to old. Okay? Depending on where you come from, okay, Nigeria, a young country. Okay? Turkey, Middle Ages. Germany, Japan, old country. The median age in Turkey is 32. Median age in Canada is 42. In less developed countries, the median age is 25, 26. Um, but as they develop, the median age goes up. Okay? I'm going to show you an example from Turkey. Um, this is the population pyramid of Turkey. You really need to get a new projector. Okay? This one. You guys are paying good money here. Huh? What is this? What is this? What is this? Yeah. It's all right. Huh? What? I, I didn't get that. Oh, where does it go? It, obviously, it doesn't go into the projector. Yeah. That, that I've, I've noticed. Okay. But they gave me two cups of tea this morning, so maybe that's where it's going. <laughs> now, okay, so you cannot tell which side is. Uh, this side is male. This side is female. You can't tell the numbers. doesn't matter. This is Turkey. Year 1970. Population pyramid is a real pyramid, okay? Now, by the way, I was the academic coordinator of uh, uh, Yelev, which is a comparable school uh, that teaches IB in German. Uh, IB program is very expensive. International programs are very expensive. Teachers are expensive. That's where the money goes, okay, to teachers, okay? <laughs> if you want good education, it's expensive. Why do you think I'm starting an online high school? It's because people are expensive. Okay? Technology is the way. In, in Canada, 
a reasonable high school is now $20,000 a year, okay? My high school will be $8,000 a year. How can I do that? Because I'm using technology. I'm using people very carefully, okay, very strategically. People teaching people, old-fashioned, gone, okay? Your grandchildren will not believe you when you tell them you actually had a teacher in front of the class and a class of, what, 24 maximum here, I assume? 24 students and, and one teacher and physics teacher went out and chemistry teacher came in and they gave you like exams and things. She won't believe that this is how you were taught. That's, that's the change I expect to happen over the next 20 years. I just wrote a book about how the education system is crumbling all over the world and how it needs to be reinitialized in some creative ways. Back to our topic, demographics. This is Turkey, 1970. Perfect population pyramid. Lots of kids, lots of young people. This is age group of 15 to 30. And very few people that are old, that can be considered old. I'm going to fa forward this, fast forward this by 50 years. Just look at how the shape is changing. 80, 90, 2000, 2010, 2020, okay? Where's, where did the pyramid go? The base disappeared. The top is becoming thicker and thicker. 50 more years. Now we're going into the future. 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70, okay? You are going to actually observe this if you stay in Turkey or if you live in a country that is demographically comparable to Turkey. If you come from the Middle East, you're going to see this a little bit later. If you live in the old world, Europe or North America, this has already happened there, okay? Now, uh, the, the net result of, of all this, what you've just seen, is, is actually this. A number of people who are at age 65 or over is going from 4% of the population to 27% of the population, okay? So, you want a prediction for me? Beautiful, wonderful future job is geriatric nurse, okay? Um, gerontology in general. All sorts of services for the elderly, okay? If you're on the technology side, exoskeleton robot-like pieces that help elderly walk easier, more easily. Um, if you are in the, on the dietary side of things, we need a whole new ecosystem that provides food for the elderly. If you are in the therapy side of things, physiotherapy for the elderly. If you are in the uh, entertainment sector, education sector, education schools, not for kids, but for the elderly. Because we don't have that many kids anymore. Look at this. This is the number of kids. This is the number of elderly. Okay, so we're going to have to learn how to teach elderly for second careers, for third careers, okay? Um, same thing with entertainment. Same thing with uh, uh, accommodation. We need accommodation for elderly. That means shorter steps, um, nurse's room on the basement floor, more socialization space, more open spaces, okay? We don't have this right now. So you're an architect. Here's a new challenge for you. You want to be an engineer? Here's a challenge for you. You don't just want to be an engineer. You want to be an engineer who, will, who wants to help elderly walk more easily, for example. Okay? So this is one definite trend that's going to impact your lives. I'd say at least a quarter of this class will be working in the um, elderly economy. Economy for the elderly. Look, it's more than a quarter of the population. Uh, the second mega trend is the shift in economic power. Economic power, economic center of the world used to be the East, China, of course, early on. And then it shifted to the West, all the way to North America. And then now it's shifting back to China. Now, one sort of radical example, I'm using unicorns to give this example. Unicorns are startups that have achieved a billion dollar in valuation. You know what a startup is, right? Technology company founded by individuals. Uh, it's reached a valuation, uh, company value of a billion dollars. 
Now, if you look at the top five startups in the world now, three of them are Chinese. Okay? Uh, you see, uh, I think Elon Musk is, Musk is here. Uh, SpaceX is number three. Uh, ByteDance and uh, DD are one and two. Okay? Now, this table used to be full of U.S. companies in the past and a few companies from Israel, perhaps. Uh, now, U.S. is still at the top, but look at China, look at India coming up. Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong. Now, what does that mean to you? What do you learn as second language? French. Huh? Chinese. Bravo. You should learn Chinese, guys. French is old world. I, my first language is German, okay? Old world. A waste of time. I mean, not complete waste of time. I can still read Goethe in its own, own original language, okay? Karl Marx in original language. That's kind of cute, nice, but it's, it's only cute, okay? Kind of hobby, okay? Now, when I go to Germany, any Germans here? Yeah, when I uh, in Deutschland bin, dann spreche ich kein Deutsch. Weil ich, wenn ich Deutsch spreche, dann uh, verstehen Sie gleich, dass ich ein Türke bin. Und dann bin ich eine zweite Klasse Mensch. But when I speak English, they can't tell from my accent that I'm Turkish. Uh, my accent is, I'm pretty accent free, okay? With the exception of V's and W's. Uh, that sort of kills me. Wheel, wheel, okay? But what, what? My, my daughters always make fun of my V's and W's. But apart from that, I don't have an accent. So when I speak English in Germany, they're quite happy to help me. When I speak German, oh, this guy is a, a schmutziger Türke, okay? <laughs> this guy is, is, is just another Turk, okay? Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not going to speak your language. Screw you. You deal with my language, okay? Uh, am, I, am I allowed to use language like this? In, 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 um, thank you. Okay. So please, guys, learn Chinese, okay? That's the future, okay? Really, learn Chinese. Um, I used to say learn Chinese or learn Russian because Russia is number one partner, economic partner of Turkey. But I predict most of you will not be living in Turkey. I think Russia is a dying world power. It's declining in population. It's declining in influence. Uh, this uh, aggression on Ukraine is one of the last breaths the Russian bear is taking. So I don't think learning Russian is a great idea for you. If you want another uh, suggestion, learn Arabic. Why? Because a lot of people speak it, okay? If you must learn a European language, uh, make it Spanish. Because people in South America speak Spanish, people in the Philippines speak Spanish. You, want, you basically want to increase your communication base when you learn a new language, okay? Um, if you go to the U.S., the number two language in the U.S. is Spanish because of the Mexicans, okay? So it does actually help a lot if you speak Spanish, in, especially in the southern part of the, of the U.S. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your grandchildren maybe will see that day when you, they won't need to learn the language. Now, there are translators, okay? Google Translate is, is, is actually getting better and better. But um, it's, uh, artificial intelligence is not far enough advanced to um, decode irony, okay? If you speak a language well, you know the colloquialism, you can tell irony, you also know the culture. Um, you can tell what's a joke, you can tell what's serious. You can actually gauge someone's mental state or psychological state uh, from the way they're saying things, not just what they're saying. AI will, well, I won't say it will never get there, but I won't see it. So learning a language still makes sense, okay? And also, I mean, just, I'll talk to you as a Turk. When somebody comes here and says, oh, uh, baklava, çok güzel, uh, kebab, uh, çok seviyorum. I go, oh, look, he bothered to learn a couple of words from one language. How beautiful a person. I love this person. That's all you need, okay? It's just soft, gentle touch. Um, same thing with Chinese. You go to, to Chinese and say a few words in Chinese, they will melt for you, okay? So learn Chinese. Number three is acceleration of urbanization. Uh, until about year 2000, 
uh, the rural population used to go up, and now it's going down. Urban population is going up, and by urban, I don't even mean Istanbul. Uh, there are cities of 40 or 50 million in the world. Guangzhou in China is close to 50 million. Uh, so is uh, Tokyo in Japan. Uh, I, I made this list long enough so that Istanbul barely made it. If you look at this list, uh, the only European city on this list is Europe and then you know, Moscow, if you consider it to be Europe. All the other ones are, are in the east, where the economy center is shifting. So, so what? How does this impact your lives? Well, you need to, well, problems that emanate from living in large cities need to be solved, okay? If you can solve those problems, you are going to be a wanted person. And what are those problems? Vertical agriculture, for example. We need to grow you know, those legumes, those tomatoes. You know, why is a tomato so expensive in Turkey? Because it's stupid transport, okay? Because we don't grow it here. It needs to be brought from someplace else. Why? It doesn't have to be brought from someplace else. We could actually grow it in high rises right here in Istanbul. It's not done yet. So if you want to be in agricultural engineering, computer science, industrial engineering, here's a thought. Vertical agriculture. You need to solve problems of traffic congestion. Who does that? Civil engineers, industrial engineers. You need to set up a sensor network system. Who does that? Electrical engineers, computer science graduates. So um, the urbanization brings problems with it. And people who are able to solve problems are going to be people in high demand. It's very simple. The future is not that hard to predict. You can see where it's going. So if you want to know what sells in the future, you look at the picture. Uh, that's your climate change. This is a map that doesn't show well here, but it's actually a color chart where red is a plus one, plus 1.5 Celsius increase in temperature. Blue is a decline in temperature. Across the six or five continents, over 100 years, as you see, lots of blues. But in Europe, we see lots of reds early on because that's where industrialization began. And nowadays, we see reds across all continents. One and a half degrees is terrible. If you make that two and a half, game over, OK? It's that serious. And right now, all of the countries are shuffling their feet. Uh, you go first. You go first, OK? Yeah, we need to reduce CO2, but why don't you do it first and then I'll join you. Totally irresponsible, okay? So what can you do about this? Well, you can be an electrical engineer and work on alternative energy sources. You can be a mechanical engineer and work on those windmills, okay? You don't need a special education to be in the energy sector. Typical engineering fields lead you there. You can be an industrial engineer who promotes more intelligent use of energy. So you can be a chemical engineer who works on, on batteries that hold more power for longer. You could be a lawyer who regulates climate change or CO2 emissions. You could be a sociologist who studies the impact of climate change on human groups. You could be a teacher who actually makes a mission out of this bringing the students' awareness up to date. So through every single profession, you can serve to fight climate change. You need to decide if that's what you want to do. Then you can choose a profession uh, to, to help you get there. But it's important to know what matters in the future. This is what matters in the future. And finally, uh, changes in technology. That's the um, easiest thing to explain. I think in 2007, were you guys there? Barely? Yeah. Yeah, just a few days, eh? I mean, <clears throat> when you were born, OK, hello, there was no Snapchat. There was no Instagram. There was no Airbnb. There was no iPhone. There was no Tesla. Can you? I mean, you're just a kid, OK? Can you imagine when you were born? We had none of this, OK? We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have Tinder. I don't know how people used to make boyfriends, girlfriends back then. I mean, when I was young, we didn't even have 
Forget about cell phones. We didn't have phones. We used to signal with smoke. That girl over there, I me like you. Okay, now it's easier. Okay, but that's how fast technology is is moving. Um, look, this is a 1956. That's a year before I was born. What they're loading on this truck is a hard drive, five megabyte hard drive. Holy shit! Seven people pushing it in. Okay. Last month I went to Gaziantep. This is a photo from Zeugma, a mosaic museum, beautiful mosaic museum, possibly the best in the world. And then I had a you know, pretty good meal. It, it looks horrible here, but it, I was actually, it was a feast, okay? These two photos, folks, is way more than five megabytes. And I have several thousand of them in my little iPhone in my pocket. 1956, you couldn't even store those two photos on this huge hard drive that people are trying to push into a truck. This happened in my lifetime, okay? Now, talking about technology in an iPhone, is Apollo 11. Your iPhone has over 100,000 times more processing power than the computers on Apollo. I mean, going to moon on in Apollo 11 was an incredible adventure. <laughs> Next to no, no techn technology on, the, on, on board, okay? Uh, and, and this happened you know, in, in a very short period of time. And this is only going to continue. Okay? So if you don't like technology, tough shit. Okay? Uh, it won't like you. And you won't have much of a life. Okay? So you better learn to like technology. Okay? Now, I'm not the only one who's saying that. Look, you know Coursera? Any, anyone took courses from Coursera? Oh, bravo. That's good. edX. And they, by the way, we're, uh, we're the only university in Turkey that allows you to take courses. Not only allows, but requires you to take the courses in Coursera and edX and gives you credit for it. Now, they also publish the most popular courses across the world, okay? Look at 2019. Machine learning, okay? That's AI. Learning how to learn, a course everybody should take. Take that, starting tomorrow. You took it? Beautiful, right? It actually helps you understand yourself, understand how your brain works, and makes you a more proficient learner. Science of well-being, okay? That's popular these days. Python, that's AI. You took Python. Way to go, man. Good call. AI for everyone. Neural nets, that's AI. English algorithms, that's an introduction to AI. Introduction to TensorFlow for AI, that's also AI. This is also introduction to AI. Okay, so bottom line, Data science and artificial intelligence, that's the future, okay? I don't care if you're studying psychology or law or sociology or literature. You have to be literate in data. You have to be, you have to be able to make meaning uh, from data. And this is not very hard, okay? It doesn't require a lot of technical study. It doesn't really require engineering level study. In fact, we created a minor in, uh, at, at MEF University, which allows students in every field to take uh, this minor in data science and artificial intelligence. And I'm happy to see students in economics, students in law, students in political science take this because um, computer science students know this already, okay? It's not new to them. Industrial engineering, mostly, but other engineers, social scientists don't know this stuff. And they are out of luck if they don't. Well, what about future of jobs? Top 10 emerging jobs in Asia Pacific, okay? I'm going to read this Thailand. I've spent a couple months in Thailand. Anybody from Thailand? No? No one from Thailand? Uh, okay. Data scientist, backend developer, data engineer, full stack engineer, product owner, data analyst, UX designer, that's a customer experience, uh, talent acquisition specialist, digital marketing specialist, front-end developer, okay? So I'm sorry, I'm just the bringer of the news to you. I don't make the world run the way it runs, okay? But if you're not techno-literate, there's no place for you. Of course, you can live, okay? But you will be what, Harari? Anybody read Harari? You all know all Harari? No one? Only two people? He calls them unemployable, 
right? This, this is worse than unemployed. Unemployed means you, can, you don't have a job now, but you could have a job tomorrow. Unemployable means there's no use for your skills anymore. Um, if you don't understand technology, if you're not technology literate, you're unemployable, okay? You better have a rich father who's willing to finance you for the rest of your life. So it's very simple. You need to be technology literate, period. So this is my predictions for you guys. You're going to live between 90 and 110 years, most of you. you know, some of you may have accidents and uh, part earlier. Some of you will make it to 120. Uh, don't be surprised because that's where the world is going. Life expectancy even in Turkey is now 78, 79. In Canada, it's 84. And it's climbing, okay? Uh, because of developments, progress in medicine and technology. Just to, to make the, the long story short, you guys are going to be living longer, okay? And uh, because of the inverted population pyramid, the retirement or the pension programs across the entire world are going to crumble. Don't expect to retire, okay? You'll be working for 50, 60 years. I'm planning to work for 50, 60 years. Huh? Oh, no, it's not depressing, my friend. It's depressing if, you, um, if you're stuck with a job that you don't like. But if you love your job, I find it refreshing. I, I'm, I'm so excited that at age 64, I'm still useful. Okay, people still invite me to do things because I have a skill set and I have knowledge that people want. And I'm doing something that I love. So you combine these. That's what I'm going to get next. You actually have a beautiful life and you have it for longer. Okay? So I'm very happy. And I'm giving you these depressing news, but I'm going to be on the same boat. I'm going to be with you. And you're going to change jobs between 10 and 30 times. Um, this is already happening in the U.S. and it started to happen in Turkey as well. Um, Zgen doesn't like to work for more than a year and a half at any job. You just keep changing jobs. I don't care about the reasons. Data speaks. Data speak, it's plural. Um, and uh, the facts are you'll be changing jobs very often. And, you know, you now want to go to university, right? Who wants to go to uh, an Ivy League school, for example? Where do you want to go? Princeton? Brown? I mean, you'll be, you'll be going there for four years, and your diploma's uh, life expectancy is maybe five years. So what I mean by that is uh, that beautiful diploma that's going to look really good on the wall. After five years, that's all it's going to do, look good on the wall, okay? If you stop learning... If you don't continue your own education, you will become gradually useless. So the shelf life of the university diploma is only five years. University diploma is neither necessary nor sufficient for success, folks. You guys are working really hard to get into university, but hey, so what? There are millions of university students in the world, okay? It doesn't make you really special. It's what you do with yourself after you get the diploma. So, uh, and, and, you know, Jobs are changing. I'm not going to scare you with jobs that are disappearing. But it's, it's actually shallow to speak of jobs that will disappear. Every job will change format. Um, every job will be done differently. More technology, less human. But the job will be there. So you need to just accept this. And you need to realize that the one skill you need is uh, the ability to adopt, uh, the ability to evolve, okay? That's really the only skill that's going to take you further. It's not money. It's not you know, how fast you run or how strong you are, not even how intelligent you are, although one definition of intelligence is being able to adopt. If you accept that definition, then being intelligent is a good thing for the future. But you need to be able to adapt. And, and the way to practice that is by getting out of your comfort zone. Um, how many of you have you been to Bayram Pasha? Wonderful. Esenler? You need to go to those poorer places in town to just get out of your comfort zone, okay? I mean, many of you live in Etilar, probably, Bebek, okay? That's great, you know, nice places. But, you know, you need to see how the rest of the world lives. When I went to India, my eyes opened up. I just went from 
the airport, international airport, to the local airport. And I saw thousands of people living on the side of the road in um, tin huts. They made fires in the middle of the night. And they're just sitting. It was like surreal. It was like post-apocalyptic world. But that's how they are happy. That's how they live. And I'm richer for having seen that. So you need to expose yourself to uh, get out of your comfort zone, expose yourself to different ways of living, different types of people, different languages, different species, to improve your ability to adopt. I mean, I'm equally comfortable with a CEO uh, as well as a worker in a factory. I'm, I'm a consultant for many industrial companies. If I can't speak to both of them equally well, I can't do my job. So that's part of adaptation. All right, so um, there are four things that matter in career planning. I'll give you a brief examples of all four, and then I'll move on to questions. What do you love doing? What are you good at? What does the world need? And uh, how can you make money? You need to ask yourself those four questions. And then you need to find the intersection of these four sets. You guys are all familiar with the set theory business, right? It's part of the curriculum. So this is what you love. This is a slide in English because I copied it from Toronto Star, a <laughs> newspaper in Canada. This is what you're good at. And if you are at the intersection of what you love and what you're good at, that's just the passion circle. You're a painter, you know, you love what you're doing. Nobody buys your stuff. Nobody needs your paintings, okay? So yeah, you're a passionate person, but hey, that's it. So that's not good enough. You actually want to move to the center. So you need to also ask the questions of what, what can I be paid for? And does the world need what I'm doing? So if you actually do something that you love and that you're good at, and the world needs it, and you know, chances are if the world needs it, somebody will pay you for it, then you are in the middle, and sir, then you don't have a depressing life. So you try to get to the center. So you need to know what you love. You need to know what you're good at. You need to know what the world needs from you, and you need to know how you can make money. Those are the four questions that you need to ask yourself. That's the fundamentals of career planning, okay? Because you want to go to the center. So what does the world need? Sustainable development goals. You don't have to think hard. They, they've done the thinking for you. Choose one of these boxes, okay? Uh, choose affordable clean energy. Choose zero hunger. I've chosen quality education, okay? So I've organized a um, sort of extracurricular boot camp for skills development, 21st century skills, free, okay? To all high school and university students because I'm doing something that schools are not doing. Um, that's one part of what I do. Uh, then I'm a, an author, I write books, uh, trying to trigger alternative educational institutions. The next thing I do is start this online high school in Canada. Why am I doing that? Because everybody's asking me how they can go to Canada. So, okay, if you wanna go to Canada, here, you can get a degree and it's gonna be easier for you to go to Canada. I'm not doing this just to send people to Canada, of course. I want to take that learning because Canada has an exceptional distance education system. All the materials are ready. I want to translate those materials into Turkish. So I want to open a, an online Turkish high school. Okay, that's my next goal. And my final goal is open an online national university in Turkey. I'm, I'm young, okay? I still have ways to go. I can finish this. So choose one of these boxes. And then have some goals in that box, okay? Um, don't choose engineering or medicine or law. Choose a goal, sustainable development goal, and then try to see how you can move through one of the well-known professions that are taught at the university towards that goal. How can you make money? It's actually quite simple. You need to have 21st century skills to make money. And nobody in Turkey speaks about this. Uh, unfortunately, I'm the only one. So if you just Google 21st century skills in Turkish, only my name comes up. It's, I find that really depressing. Uh, so we keep teaching people 20th century or 19th century skills at schools. Um, the, the current school being an exception, of course, because IB does provide 21st century skills, clearly. Okay? I guess if you're not in the IB program, you are also taught by individuals who have been enlightened by the IB program. So you're given some of these 21st century skills. But what are they? 
um, learning and innovation. That's creativity and innovation. Critical thinking, problem solving, communication, and teamwork. I tell you, the Turkish education system is geared towards reducing these skills to the bare minimum. Okay? If you know anything about the Turkish education system, it's geared towards turning you into uh, robots who just say, yes, sir. You're right, sir. You're older than me, so you must know what you're talking about, sir. I'm uh, your uh, follower, sir. Thank you, sir. The entire Middle East is like that, okay? In fact, the entire East is like that. Critical thinking is a Western concept, okay? But doesn't mean we can't learn from it. Um, this is terrible in Turkey. Um, this is why I think IB program, I think of the world for IB programs, because they're basically organized around improving your learning and innovation skills. Then we have the literacies, media, technology, and information literacy, financial literacy, macroeconomic literacy. And then we have life and career skills. Uh, this is being able to adopt, being flexible, taking initiative, being able to govern yourself, manage yourself, uh, social and intercultural skills, productivity and accountability, leadership and responsibility. How's my instant translation skills? Not bad, huh? I'm doing all right. Now, this unfortunately is a list created by Americans. Well, it's fortunate for them, unfortunate for us, because we don't give a shit about this. We just try to create a pious religious group of students who will vote for the government. That's no goal of education. The goal of education is to enlighten the individual, okay? Education should be uh, egalitarian. It should be accessible. It should be democratic. It should be scientific. Uh, it should be individual orientation, individual oriented and enlightenment oriented. Uh, Turkish education system is none of the above. IB system uh, actually satisfies this checklist to a great extent. So these are the skills that employers are looking for, okay? I mean, I'm, I worked as a business school dean in three different business schools, and the number one skill they look is uh, communication skills. Can you actually speak without saying, uh, um? Can you actually look into the eyes of the people when you're talking? Can you actually use your body language? This is what they look for, okay? If you can't, you can improve it, my friend. I mean, this, uh, these are improvable skills. Um, you can get training. Here's an, uh, maybe you caught that. You can get training in improving your presentation skills. Number two skill they uh, want is teamwork. Can you actually produce in teams? None of the problems I showed you, the sustainable development goals, can be solved by an individual working alone on a computer. You need teamwork for all of them, okay? So employers want teamwork and communication skills, and they want you to be a critical thinker, innovator, and a self-motivated initiative taker, and we don't produce that, okay? But you should know what the employers want. So as many projects as you can, as many team projects as you can, do as many presentations as you can, solve as many problems as you can, but not just multiple choice problems, meaningful problems. Read as many books as you can, watch TED Talks. That's how you improve these skills. Organize events. Why is the school organizing this event? Why is not a student club doing this? How many student clubs do you have? It's actually kind of a weak point of the IB program. Student clubs are sort of pushed into the background because there's just not enough time. It's terrible. It's the result of us thinking that we know what's best for you. We don't, okay? Create your own club, organize your own meetings, organize your own activities. That's how you learn more than what you can learn in the classroom. Take initiative. Work every chance you get. How many of you have actually worked and got paid for more than a month? Bravo, okay? This is a much, good, much better ratio, almost 10%, than what I see in Turkish schools. At every chance you get, you should work, period. You should work as a barista. You should work as a, um, as a server, as a waiter, as a uh, laundry agent or someone doing the dishes, okay? Do the shittiest jobs. Huh? Carpenter definitely counts, my friend. It's an exceptionally important skill, and its time will never pass. Because you can actually create something with your hands. 
I didn't say that, but why don't you just go to sleep, okay? All right, so this is, this is what the employers want from you. I tell you, I'm a university professor. I have hundreds of students that I try to place on in jobs, and uh, they don't ask you about your GPA. They don't ask you about your courses. Of course, you have, you have those courses. Otherwise, they wouldn't give you a diploma. The first question they ask is, tell me about the project. Tell me about student clubs. Tell me about what you've done outside the class, extracurricular activities. Tell me about the countries you visited. These are the questions you get asked, OK? Um, all right, so what do you want? What makes you tick? Something people usually don't think about. But I copied this list from a, uh, from a book written by two uh, employees of the Harvard Professional Development Program, uh, two PhDs in psychology. Uh, you need to decide what matters for you, OK? Is it money? Is it financial gain? Is it power? Influence, is it variety? Is it lifestyle? Is it autonomy? Is it intellectual challenge? Is it altruism? It's usually a combination of these. And what I suggest you do is you, you're doing a good job. You take a picture of this, and you look at this list for half an hour, and you decide which ones are most important for you. If you choose autonomy, and I ask you, what do you want to be? You want to say you, you want to be a banker. Hello, where's the autonomy in that? Any paid profession, no autonomy. Autonomy matters to me a lot, okay? So if autonomy matters a lot to you, you could be uh, an author, you could be a researcher, you could be an artist, you could be an academic, or you could be an entrepreneur, self-employed, okay? Every other employment is going to come with strings attached, and you will have no autonomy. What matters to me is also intellectual challenge. I want to do something that no one has done before. I want to write an academic paper. So getting a PhD was the right thing for me. Altruism is important for me, doing good for others. So being a teacher is a good profession for somebody who's altruistic. So combine autonomy, intellectual challenge, and altruism, I'm in the right position. So now you know, my depressed friend, what I mean by ikigai, OK? So I found my ikigai spot. Ikigai means, uh, I don't know, ballı börek in Turkish. Katmaklı <laughs> kadayıf. Uh, it's where you want to be in life, okay? It's the key to happiness. A like, goal of life is not money, guys. Of course it's not money. Money is just a conduit. It's, it's, it's a channel. It, the goal is happiness. And to be happy, you need to like what you're doing. You need to be good at it. Somebody has to need it, and somebody needs to give you money for it. All right, so choose three of them, and then talk to your counselor as to which program to join, which university to join, okay? For some people... For example, for me, security is not important at all. I don't care if I lose my job tomorrow. I know I can make money in many different ways, OK? But some people, for some people, security is very important. So they want to be a government employee. That's the most secure job in the world. They'll pay you no matter how lousy you are, right? So if security is important for you, you should seek a government job, OK? Um, managing people, if managing people and relationship is important to you, Managing people, but not that's not in the sense that ordering people what to do. It's helping. She likes that. This is why, why she gyrated to the position of director at the school. I also like that. I like consulting with people. I like telling them what I think they could do to advance their careers. Okay, So uh, asking yourself these questions actually helps you in designing your career. And finally, what are you good at? Okay, my experience, Turkish students are not really good at much of anything. So I don't depress people further. You're depressed enough. So I'll just give you some advice as to what I think you should be doing. Uh, you need to develop skills. Content is not dead, okay, but it's free. I mean, math, physics, Khan Academy is free, okay. Coursera edX is free. Knowledge is free. If you don't get it, it's your fault, okay. You should go get it. It's free. But what really matters, what's not free, what's more difficult to get, is developing your skills. Um, and then, of course, you need to um, diversify. You need to differentiate yourselves from the herd. Okay? For my Turkish students, I, I say, um, first of all, let me just explain this little chart for you. If you are in the blue zone, this is level zero, you are unemployable. Don't bother. Okay? Nobody's going to give you a job. You can't do anything for anybody. You need to be in the red zone in all of these five 
categories, and you need to be in the green zone in at least two of the categories. So you need to speak English really well, done, okay? Not good enough for you because, you know, that's a background thing. You need to learn Russian or Chinese. You need to be really good in Excel. I don't know uh, any company that does not use Excel. Excel is the, you know, de facto tool of all businesses. Not enough, you need to learn Python, my friend. You need to, it you know, goes, yeah, you need to learn VBA. You need to do uh, as many internships as possible. You need to work as often as possible. You also need to work part-time before you graduate. I mean, when I see a university graduate who already has two years of experience, and you know, compared to somebody coming from a top school with no experience, guess who I'm gonna choose, okay? Experience always beats no experience. Um, exchange programs are exceptional. You guys are lucky because you come from someplace else, so you've actually been to Turkey. And that's, uh, that's an asset for you, but visit more countries. I mean, I learned the most, not from visiting Germany, but from visiting Thailand and India. So go to countries that are as radically different from yours as possible, uh, so you can, you know, broaden your horizons. Élargissez vos horizons. You speak French? Un petit peu, okay. Wonderful. Ah, Sunday, why? <laughs> Uh, and of course, clubs and hobbies. Uh, so you need to differentiate yourself. You need to make yourself uh, unique, okay? And that gets you to Ikigai. All right, this is what I think is gonna happen in the future. I'm gonna skip that, I'm gonna skip that. How can I help you? I've organized this Yetkan, but it's in Turkish. So not good enough for you. It's actually a brilliant alternative education program. So tell your friends, tell your Turkish friends that if they haven't joined Yetkan yet, they should. It's free if you speak Turkish. I also recommend it for you because my goal is to, to help you attain those skills that I think is, uh, are uh, sought after in the 21st century. I'm actually going to offer this to the teachers because I think that the teachers themselves don't have these skills. So May 1st, I'm starting to teach about 1,000 teachers, Turkish teachers, high school teachers, um, on how to improve the 21st century skills of students. Um, uh, I have books, and that's how you can contact me. Um, the books are in Turkish, so I'm not going to dwell on them. Uh, but I, I do speak English, so I can answer your questions in English if you care to ask me questions. All right, so a mm, little over an hour. Uh, questions? Now, I've been told you guys are shy. I don't know why. That sort of rhymed. Yeah, go ahead, sir. My little depressed friend, yes. <laughs> Do you think astronomy and physics is going to be like a good kind of career to work in? in What's the your future? name? Astronomy and physics. Your name? Uh, Shamsettin. 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 Yeah. Do you love astronomy and physics? Uh, yeah. Is it a good career? You should study it. Uh, okay. Never mind whether it's going to be. I mean, you, you can't get a job in the area. Okay. But who gives a shit? You, you just you need to do what you love doing. And you need to find a way to make money doing what you love doing. It, physics is mother of modeling, okay? If you are good in physics, forget about astronomy. If you're good in physics, you could be a financial engineer. Did you know that? Most people in the Wall Street are, have PhDs in physics and math. So you could find a way to make yourself money. You could create an NGO. You could create a startup that teaches physics and astronomy to kids. Um, just do what you love, okay? Don't let your parents tell you that you should be a doctor because doctors make good money. Okay? You be a doctor if you want to be a doctor. Okay? I'm a different individual. And I want to do what I want to do. You can find a way to make money through any path of study. And chances are you're going to switch anyway. You're going to start with astronomy and physics. And in, in year two, you're going to switch to mechanical engineering because mechanical engineers make those planes, make those rockets that go into space. Okay? You can say that's good enough for me, okay? If you want to build a vehicle that goes to Mars, that's mechanical engineers for you. There's some electrical engineering, computer science in there as well. Um, but you can switch, okay? The beauty of the university system, especially abroad, is that you can switch as many times as you want. My younger daughter never switched. My older daughter switched once. But, you know, you can, she finished in five years. So what? She took a gap year. Take a gap year, okay? There's no rule that says you should start university as soon as you finish high school. That's crazy, actually. 
It's the worst thing a young kid could do to himself is to start university right away. Why? You're going to live 110 years. You're going to work for 60 years. Take a year off, man. Travel the world. Read some books. Do something fun. Get to know yourself. And then go to university. Call it your prep year, okay? University prep year. That's what I offered to my daughter, older daughter. She, she took it. She came from, I said, look, if you want, I'll come to Canada or you can come to Turkey. She decided to come to Turkey. She said, ask me, what, what will we do? We go to movies. We go to theaters. We would eat out. We would write reviews of restaurants. We would discuss books. We would go to museums. We would go to concerts. We've done a lot of that. And it was one of the most beautiful uh, years of my life. And she really enjoyed it, too. She actually grew as a person during that gap year. And then she got bored. Well, that's what she said, but she actually missed her boyfriend. And she went back to Canada two months after. And then a month after, she kicked her boyfriend out. And, uh, and fathers of girls go, yes, whenever the girl kicks out the boyfriend. She's done that four times already, my girl. <laughs> ah. I'm, I'm feeling so sorry for those boys. My, my older daughter is a handful. Yeah. Mm. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Name? Ella. Ella. Um, I was going to ask, what do you think about law and how useful it will be in like the upcoming years? What do I think of what? Law. Law. Okay. A good question. Which country do you want to study law in? Um, I was thinking UK. UK, okay. Um, UK, that's uh, not continental law. That's Anglo-Saxon law. Um, law is not as hot as it used to be. Um, unemployment galore. And law schools are having a hard time filling their slots. So no longer um, guaranteed employment. But if you play your cards right, I mean, you already speak English. Quite well. What's your nationality? German. Okay. German Turkish. Okay. So you probably speak German Turkish and English. And if you get into something like a, you don't. You don't speak German. Was für eine deutsche Frau sind Sie? Warum sprechen Sie kein Deutsch? Das geht doch nicht. Hundrassen. All right. That's okay. You don't need to learn German. But English and Turkish is a good combo. And if you study, for example, startup law, uh, mergers and acquisitions, you know what that means? Companies buying each other out, okay? A German company coming into Turkey, buying a Turkish company, or partnering with a Turkish company, or selling patent rights to this company. So basically, commercial law, okay? But between companies. Um, internet law, intellectual property law, uh, these are growing areas in law. Uh, but if you are in constitutional law, for example, don't look for a job. If you are in uh, penal law, we use the same penal law as Germany. But it, it's not that easy to get jobs. So you need to look what's, where this, the, the world is going and what the legal needs are going to be. Um, a lot of migrants, right? A lot of refugees, right? So migrant law, refugee law, very important. Technology, internet, very important. So if you play your cards right, you can get really good jobs as a lawyer. Um, but you won't actually work as a lawyer. You won't work as a trial lawyer. You'll work as a legal consultant, okay? Um, and uh, you need to go to school in the UK or Canada or, or US because that's a different law, legal system. The rest of the Europe is a different law system. Um, you cannot practice law in Turkey with a degree from UK, but you don't want to be in the bar anyway. You don't want to be a trial lawyer anyway. You want to be a legal consultant, and that you can be. That would be my recommendation to you. Go to a school, good school, learn law, the Anglo-Saxon law, and then work with companies who want to do business between an Anglo-Saxon country and Turkey. Um, and, and use the... Uh, areas of growth for your specialty in law. Uh, I hate law. I mean, I'm an engineer. Engineers try to change the society. Lawyers try to hold the society down. Lawyers are anti-change, okay? They are the most boring people. Uh, but we need them, okay? 
So yeah, you can get a job as a lawyer if you do, if you play your cards right. But why do you want to be a lawyer? Why do you want to study law? I mean, uh, like my, my younger daughter got into molecular genetics because she wanted to, she wanted, was curious about our body. She, she, to her, it was amazing that once you tore your meniscus, it would never heal itself. You'd live with a torn meniscus all your life. That, to her, that was unacceptable. She said, we got to find a solution to this. This is such a design fault, okay? Whoever designed your body really screwed up. So we need to fix that. Okay, I, I, I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then one of the first things she did as an undergraduate student was to print cartilage, nose cartilage, to somebody with a burnt face. Accident, you burn your face, you lose your nose. She prints it, 3D printing. You have a nose again, okay? Now, that's useful law. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm blunt, okay? <laughs> yes. What countries are best to study in? It's, it's really up to you. I, I taught a PhD program in, in Thailand, and even in Thailand, which is kind of a poor country, there are some good schools, okay? Um, clearly, higher education is tops in the US. No one will doubt that, okay? because they hire, they recruit talent from all over the world. More than half the US teaching power is not US born, okay? In computer science, it's more like 90%. So, you know, it's like the NBA. Which one's the best basketball league? It's the NBA, because they get the best players from, so clearly it's the US, okay? But uh, UK has some good schools, and I, I don't really think that matters that much. For example, Denmark is a great option. Netherlands is a great option. Why would you pay $60,000 for a good school in, Canada, in the U.S. if you can get it for $40,000 in Canada? So you need to find um, a, a balance. Where do you, for example, I would not want to live in the U.S., period. Okay? I went to school in the U.S. five years. That was good enough. I loved living in Canada. Canada was much more like Europe. Um, so I don't care how good you are. I mean, I don't care. I, I actually taught at George Washington University last year for one semester. I did not like it either. I mean, Washington is the most cosmopolitan of American cities, but even that was a little bit too redneck for me, a little bit too um, unicultural. Okay, I like multicultural, I like cosmopolitan, so I like Northern Europe. Okay, if I could go to school again, I'd probably choose between Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Holland, maybe Germany. Uh, the advantage of Germany is too bad you don't speak German because schools are free in Germany. Uh, I mean, you pay nothing. And in France, they're like 2,000 euros, okay? England, whoo, very expensive. Do not go to school in England. That's crazy. I don't care if they have Oxford. It's terribly expensive. Uh, go to a, a reasonably priced or, or free North European school. I don't care if your father is rich. You can make better use of that money by using it for your next startup. You don't have to give it to a school simply because your father has the money. Choose a school in Denmark, choose a school in Holland, choose a school in Belgium. Uh, for example, some of our students went from MEF to, uh, which school did they go to in, in Belgium? Ghent? No. Bruges? Leuven? They went to Leuven. And they did three years at MEF, two years at Leuven. Uh, I don't think it was Leuven. Huh? Liège, Liège, yeah, yeah, Liège. Two years of uh, school. Liège, they got a, a, an undergraduate program uh, diploma from MEF, a graduate diploma from Liège. Now they're both working in Belgium. They paid $4,000 uh, per year, euros, for the program. So now they're making 3,000 euros a month, okay? So they, they financed the program within a few months after they're getting, getting jobs. And now they're getting married. They just sent me an invitation. Yeah, it was, you know, good plan. So, so what if the American schools are the best? They're also expensive. But University of Connecticut, inexpensive. Okay? You can choose, you can find inexpensive schools in the US, mostly in the Atlantic Northeast. Uh, good, inexpensive schools. Same thing with Canada. The most expensive school in Canada is Toronto, and that's only $48,000 Canadian, which is like, I don't know, $40,000 American or something, or $38,000 American. Uh, there are schools that are a lot less. Also, there's something called community colleges. 
Um, I'll give you uh, a, a tip. Teaching is better at community colleges because that's all they do. They're pure teachers. In university, you pay those big bucks because they are researchers. What do you care about their research? If you don't have academic career aspirations, 95% of you won't, why are you paying for their research? Go to a college. Colleges in Canada are $16,000. In two years, you get a, an associate degree is what's called, it's like only sense in Turkey. But with the two-year program, you can learn game design, 3D modeling, software engineering, and you can get a job. Then you get permanent residency in Canada, and you go back to a Canadian university and pay the Canadian citizen fee, which is only $6,000 instead of $40,000. So the smartest thing to do is to actually go to a college, get a job, work for a few years, and then go to university. If you still wish to, complete your university education and for one-fourth the price. Okay? And also, you have two years, three years of experience in your pocket by the time you graduate from the university. Uh, these colleges have uh, very uh, forward-looking programs. For example, you cannot find game design programs in many universities. Colleges, they have game design programs. They have AI programs. They have 3D modeling programs. Um, if you're interested in luxury brand management, they have those programs. Restaurant management, they have those programs. Uh, free time administration, they have those programs. Because they're much more um, occupation-oriented. They're occupational. And the first thing you have in mind is, what am I going to do? How am I going to make a living? Okay, go to a college, get a college degree, get real teachers, professional teachers teach you, and then work for a few years, and then go to university. University is a luxury for most of us, okay? In fact, there's going to be fewer and fewer students going to university in the future. Put that down. Your grandchildren will, are, are much less likely to go to university than you are. Why does everyone need a university diploma? You need a, a list of certificates, okay? You need badges, but not necessarily a university diploma. Microsoft Office certificates, Google certificates, Google has a program. You know about this, a Google certification program? You finish that and you start a job at Google, a one-year program. They don't want a university diploma. What do they want? To, why would they want a university diploma? My nephew is a game designer. Any, anyone interested in game design? Mobile game design? He's a game designer. You know what he studied at university? He studied hotel and restaurant management. Hotel and restaurant management. And he did internships at Swiss Hotel, Hilton, and so on. And here I am thinking he's going to be a director of a wonderful hotel in somewhere in Singapore. I'm going to go there for a conference, and he's going to give me the King's Suite, and he's going to give me some expensive cognac, and, and some, you know, I'm going to be, you know, putting my foot, feet up against the ledge of the, of the window and enjoying myself. He comes to me and says he doesn't want to do hotel management. I said, why? Because I'm in love with game design. Okay, well. So what? So I learned it myself. He's a self-taught game designer, okay? He's already in his third job, and he's making two to three times as much as most recent university graduates. And he gets a job offer every week because his LinkedIn profile, how many of you have LinkedIn profiles? Uh, get LinkedIn profiles, guys. If you're under 16, you can't, I know that. But once you're above a certain age, get a LinkedIn profile. And if your LinkedIn profile says Unity, you know what Unity is? It's a game engine, okay? My Python guy knows about Unity. Add Unity, okay? You'll get a job. Forget about university, my friend. Why waste five years if you can get a job and then start your own gaming company? That's my nephew's goal. He wants to start his own gaming company. You know, Turkey's biggest export these days is, is gaming companies. Right? Gram Games, uh, Peak Games, Dream Games. Um, the most successful Turkish companies are mobile, uh, hyper-casual game design companies. So if you enjoy playing video games, don't tell, let your parents tell you that, hey, this is not a good way to spend your time. Hey, mom, this is actually the future, okay? Because as an educator, I need people who are good in Unity so I can move into AR, VR, you know, because the software you need to write educational content 
is the same software as the game content. It's, they use Unity or Unreal Game Engine. Uh, that's where the future is going. AR, VR, XR, okay? And that's Unity for you. So if you speak that language, no need for university. All right, so your, your parents, this is live to parents, right? They hate me for this, okay? Don't bother going to university. Uh, not everybody needs university education. And here they've been indoctrinating you for years. Well, you go to a good school. And, hey, maybe, maybe not. Yes, sir. So I'm thinking of uh, being a doctor. Instead. You're thinking of being a doctor. I feel sorry for you already. <laughs> it's what I like, sir. Oh, that's that. Then definitely you should do it, man. You know what? I've been watching The Good Doctor. Yes. Have you seen the series? I've watched I have parts. deepest yes. respect for surgeons. Okay. Uh, surgeons, yes. But most of the doctors, boring, very boring. So um, I'm thinking of studying medicine, and I also like uh, computer science and things with like computers. If in the future I get bored of medicine, would there be like a way to combine computer science and technology with yes. medicine? Yes, definitely. Um, for example, we have a professor in our computer science department. He also teaches in psychology. Um, he's interested in neuroscience, how our brain works, how we learn. Um, th there are clearly crossovers all over the place, okay? Um, pure medicine, when my daughter, younger daughter, told me that she was interested in uh, health, I was afraid she was going to say she wants to be a doctor. And I said, a doctor? She said, no, but that's boring. I said, why? Until that time, I hadn't thought about this. He said, she said, uh, well, they just uh, treat patients. They're like technicians. And they basically n use known techniques to diagnose known illnesses and give them known medication. Okay? And she also said, I don't want to see 30 people a day. Of course, the number is not 30. Okay? <laughs> In Turkey, it's more like 130. Uh, she said, I don't like people. I... I thought, did I create a monster? What did we do to this girl? But knowing yourself to that level helps a lot. If you like people, if you like helping people, then being a doctor is a good idea. My daughter is an introvert. She doesn't like interacting with a lot of people. She has a small group of close friends, and that's enough for her. So being a doctor would not have been right for her. She's also not interested in known things, okay? She wants to do something new. That's why she moved into science as opposed to being an MD. Um, a lot of progress in medicine is not made by doctors. It's made by PhDs in medicine, engineers, scientists, biology, genetics, and so on. So if you want to help people, being a doctor is a great idea. Um, if you want to do something new, uh, then you may find it insufficient. Uh, so keeping up your technology side strong is a really good idea because there's going to be more and more robotics in medic medicine more and more uh, exoskeleton you know machine and man working together uh, implant is an exoskeleton for example tooth implant is an exoskeleton um, you could work on um, devices because you know basic human anatomy if you know a little bit of technology and a little bit of anatomy you could help design. For example, I'm looking for a device for my father so he could, his, his knees, his legs are very weak. He's 93 years old, okay? An exoskeleton that goes down the leg uh, will give him a bit of spring and make him easier to walk. I, I'm sure there are devices like that. I just couldn't find one, a good one uh, in Turkey. So uh, you could work on, on these sorts of things. They are in the crossover area between medicine and technology, engineering, computer science, all combined. Um, go for it. Go for it, but every year ask yourself the question, am I in the right place? Is this the right place for me? And if you feel like it's not the right place for you, change. Don't, don't stay because you've spent two years there. That's called sunk cost. That's time already spent. No time is wasted. Okay, You've learned something. Put that in your pocket. Move on with your life. Yes. We have to leave after this question, I've been warned. Because the preppies are coming, the little kids are coming. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay, can you? 
Okay. Uh, my question just came up when you were talking about extracurriculars. So um, the ones that are applying to the US are always encouraged to do volunteer work. And on LinkedIn, if you go through people's um, profiles, you'll see that so many students are starting their own volunteer companies and such like that, but some of them have the same purpose or no purpose at all and get completely abandoned the moment they get into a good university. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is a problem or yes. we can never have too many uh, social companies like that? Well, it, it's a terrible problem if you are gaming the system. Some people just join those clubs because they want their resume to look rich, okay? But a smart recruiter can actually tell the difference between someone who's genuinely interested in a cause and who's simply just showing off. Um, you can stop doing certain things because you're just running out of time. That's understandable. But you have to have some, some social good in your life all the time. My younger daughter is actually, um, uh, she's, she came in second in the uh, uh, artistic Gymnastics World Cup. She's a competitive athlete, okay? And then she tore uh, something here in her hip. So she stopped competing, but she continued as a teacher of kids. So she makes money. She makes a lot of kids happy. That's a social program that also pays, okay? And she continued that all the way into her master's program. Uh, that means she was genuinely interested in artistic gymnastics, and she actually cared about those little kids. Um, so I would, as a recruiter, as a company HR person, I would look for um, a story in you. I don't really care about how many clubs you've joined. I want to hear your story. I want to see how these clubs are helping you achieve what you want in life. And they have to have some sort of meaning. If you just join five clubs, because five clubs look good on your CV, I can tell right away. So you need to work on your story, which is called, you know, you also submit a one pager to universities. That story needs to justify your uh, social life, your social side, because universities are not interested in avatars. They're not interested in machines. They're interested in uh, entire human beings. I know you're running short of time, so I'm gonna give it back. But those stories are easy to make up as well. I know, but uh, I, I mean, I try to uh, make one up and try to deceive me. You, you can't usually. <laughs> I, c I can tell. Um, anyway, uh, it's not about getting into a top university, okay? I was accepted into every university I applied to, so what? I was accepted at uh, Northwestern and Georgia Tech. Those are top engineering schools, okay? So what? It's not hard, okay? But it's what you do with your life after you got accepted. And if the school thinks that you've deceived them, uh, they will let you know in, in certain ways, okay? You can only fool yourself. You can't fool all the people all the time. It's Bob Marley song. You can't fool all the people all the time. You can only fool some people some of the time. Most importantly, you can't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Don't try to fool yourself just to gain admission into a lousy university. Don't be a liar. You, you have to live with yourself. That's not easy. Not easy to live with yourself if you're a liar. You have to have a higher goal in life than getting into a lousy university. Don't let your parents convince you into lying into your application forms just so, just so they can be proud of you being admitted into University X. Go to University Y, go to University Z. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Uh... Dear citizens, I know uh, Mr. Erhan Ar Arkut, since 2013, which was the most important things happened in Turkey. If you look at the, you know, Google, you'll find it anyway. So I was following him closely. I, I never ever missed his speech um, uh, as much as possible. So thank you very much one more time. And if I summarize what, it, what he said to you, keep yourself updated and upgraded and do what you love. So thank you very much, one more time. And you can write to me. You can write to me, we can meet in smaller groups. If you, all you need is to buy me some coffee and some cement, and I'll chat with you. <laughs> but you have to come to MEF, hey? I'm not coming back here. You have to come to my neck of the woods, okay? Yeah.
Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, madam. Yes, thank you. And the last thing uh, I wanted to share with you. It really is beautiful. Huh? <laughs> There's an ant. Yeah, it's organic. You like it? <laughs> beautiful, huh? And uh, we ordered projection, but because of the you know pandemic, we are waiting for it. Ages. Okay. Thank you very much. Well. <laughs>